Welcome back, everyone, to the Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization Show, the home of Googleization Nation, where we talk with HR and business thought leaders about the crazy shift going on all around us and explore the disruptive convergence of technology, business, and people. Here are your hosts, Ira Wolf and Jason Cochran. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Geek Skeezers and Googleization. Thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. I'm Ira Wolf. And if you think this is just another podcast, think again. We are the voice of the most important conversations on the future of work confronting business leaders and people today. Our goal is to bring you ways to reimagine tomorrow and explore the ever-changing convergence of business, people, and technology. Regretfully, my host, Jason, is working with a client today, and let me put special emphasis on regret, because Jason was really looking forward to today's conversation, and you'll soon find out why. He will rejoin us during our next live show. So let me ask you, Googleization Nation, have you ever had something to say, but you felt powerless and voiceless? Like many of you, you might have been in an organization or maybe a relationship where you had a great idea or discovered a problem others just didn't see, but you feared you can lose your job, hurt somebody's feelings, get reprimanded if you spoke up, or knew that the moment you opened your mouth, you'd be attacked by your boss, your coworker, or otherwise they get really defensive. So whether you're watching live or listening to the replay, hopefully we'll hear from you Please post a comment, especially during the live show or even during the replays, if this has happened, or just acknowledge that you've been in this situation before. Jason and I have been anticipating this show for over 12 months when our guest, Stephen Shed Shedleski, last visited Geek Skeezers and Googleization, and he shared that he was writing his first book. Well, here we are. The book in 2023 will be out in October. I had the good fortune of reading an advanced copy, and without exaggeration, I believe in the very near future, this will be considered one of those business classics that you that you just that everybody needs to read. So Shed will be joining me very, very shortly. But before I in- introduce Shed, and before I jump into our perfect labor storm segment, I've got a couple good announcements. So one is my new newsletter, BYO Brain Brew, it's just a month old, has over 3,000 subscribers. And in each issue, I'm debunking manager myths based on what we've learned from neuroscience, such as the good old left brain, right brain theory, the human ability to multitask. And an upcoming issue, I'll be talking about why the myth that we can't teach old dogs new tricks, and I'm probably one of those old dogs, is a myth. And in this week's newsletter, I debunked the myth about photographic memory. The newsletter is free, and you can get it at irawolf.beehive. That's B E E H I I V.com, irawolf.beehive.com. And in one more piece of big news, my newest co authored book, the Change, Insights to Self-Empowerment, which I co-authored with 19 other thought leaders, will be available next week. And you can download it, the digital version for free just by going to irawolf.com. Now, let's jump into the perfect labor storm, where we focus on disruptive, transformative, surprising, or worrisome trends that we believe you should know. And in keeping with today's theme of a speak-up culture, a just-released study by BetterUp found that organizations that help employees improve their well-being see a 255% increase. I'll repeat it, 255% increase in five-year average revenue growth, 87% increase in profit margins, and 27% increase in year-over-year revenue growth. One way to improve well-being is by creating a psychologically safe space. And in addition to boosting revenues and profits, it's not so bad for recruitment and retention either. A survey by Oyster HR revealed that psychological safety is one of three things that employees value most in today's workplace. It was only beat by regular pay raises, and it was followed by flexible work. So in other words, 
More than eight in 10 employees consider psychological safety one of the most valued aspects of the workplace. And one more thing, it's also not bad for safety. The National Safety Council just released a, a survey that found that not only was physical safety correlated to the histi history of in injury, but so was psychological safety. Of the respondents working in person at least one day a week, those who felt psychologically say, unsafe on the job were 80% more likely to report they had been injured at work, requiring medical attention or missed days of work. With that all said, it's time for our guest, Stephen Shedletsky, or Shed to his friends. His why is to help leaders make it safe and worth it for people to speak up. As a thought leader on psychological safety in the workplace, he supports leaders and organizations in all industries where human beings work. He is the author of the new book that I mentioned earlier, Speak Up Culture, When Leaders Truly Listen, People Step Up. It'll be out in October. A little bit about Shed, after years on the corporate track, he was introduced and inspired by someone who's inspired a lot of us, Simon Sinek. Soon after meeting Simon, he became the fourth person to join his team. He worked with Simon and his team for over a decade, and he became chief of staff and head of brand experience training and development, where he added a global team of speakers and facilitators. So let's give a big, warm Googleization Nation welcome to today's guest, Stephen Shed Shedleski. Hello, Ira. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And indeed, we can multitask. It just means we do more than one thing poorly. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. And yeah. uh, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of experience in, in doing that. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So, so let's start. Yeah, again, I can't believe it's a year. It was actually July 31st uh, last year, so like 54 weeks, 55 weeks or so. Cool. And uh, we had a great conversation, and you just shared that you were in the midst of the book. And I, I guess one of the things that stuck out, I don't know if you shared it during that interview or I heard it on one of the other ones, but you taught, I, I guess you said a lot of people ask you, when are you going to write your first book? When are you going to mm -hmm. write your first book? And you didn't do that for years because you said you'd only write it when you had something to write about. Yeah. So you wrote about, you wrote a, so you took this initiative, you're writing about uh, speak up culture. Mm -hmm. Why now? What, what? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, as you mentioned in the introduction, you know, I've been on the speaking circuit sharing Simon Sinek's message for over a decade. And so when you're on stages talking about, you know, leadership and business philosophy and essentially doing the work of, thought leadership or sharing another thought leader's ideas, you know, you're often asked, when are you going to write your own book? And so my response was always, if and when I ever come across something worth writing about. So, and, you know, even when I thought, you know, it was just over two years ago, I started having the inklings and ideas if I think I actually may have come across something in this idea called speak up culture, but I wasn't yet sure if it was a book or an article. <laughs> You know, because there's a difference between a two page article and an 192 page book, you know, and so I knew I had something and an idea and a perspective. And fortunately, as I began to work on it more and began to surround myself with an, an amazing team who helped me bring this book to life and create an outline, it was very gratifying to create an outline because it's like, oh, I actually do have a book with 11 chapters, not just an article, though an article is great. The answer to your question, why now? Why this book? So two two reasons. One, which has kind of been retrospective as I wrote this book. I mean, I've realized for every great leader, leadership is personal. And sort of my personal stake into this book, Speak Up Culture, is twofold. One, I grew up with a stutter. So I grew up with a speech impediment. I still do have a stutter. I've, I do the work to keep overcoming it. It still pops up. Most people can't hear it and don't know, but I know and I feel it and I experience it. I've become quite strategic in how I navigate, navigate it, changing words or lowering softness of harsh syllables. I, I, I work with it. I married a speech therapist. Good choice for me, uh, not just for myself, more so for my kids and nieces and nephews. So I know what it feels like to have something to say, but to lack the confidence or the physiology 
to raise my hand and say it. I know that feeling of voicelessness and it's a hard, awful feeling. And I know that others have that feeling as well, whether it's due to a speech impediment or something completely different about the culture they're in or the makeup of themselves. The other is I've been parts of teams and organizations in my 15 plus year career where there has been a speak up culture and it's marvelous, you know, the the depth and the intimacy of the relationships, people that I would call best friends and people that I would say, I love you and mean it. And of course, that's not just good for relationships. Relationship is the foundation of what we, what we can accomplish. All the stats you just shared from Better Up and everything, it's good for business so long as it's a pure intent, right? If it's like, oh, let's do team offsite building so that we can drive revenue, mm, that's artificial and that's just outside in thinking. If it's genuine and there's real trust and psychological safety, it's good for business. And then the last thing I'll say, and, and would love to hear your, your reflections as well, is I've also been parts of teams where there isn't a speak up culture, where people might speak up, but it's very filtered. You're careful what you say and who you say it to. It's more of a, a, a zip it or a filter it or a, or a shut up culture. And so I've, I've even seen a culture transform from one in which there is a speak up culture and due to leadership changes, one where there isn't a speak up culture. And not only is it bad for business, it's bad for the health and well-being of the people who show up to work there, whether physically or virtually. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. It, but one thing we talk about, and, and again, we're, we're talking about culture, and sometimes culture seems to get lumped in under human resources. It's like, you're responsible for that. The C-suite, the board of directors, the, no one else is. So let's talk. I, I know you, 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 I mean, this is everything we're talking about is about leadership. Yes. But leadership is, is a hugely broad term. I got a master's mm -hmm. in leadership. Yeah. And it was like, even within that, it, there, you know, over two years of study, well, actually it took me five years to do two years of study. But with that, it is so broad. It is so broad. Yeah. Um, I, and I know you, you've shared comments on that. Well, but well. I, I'll just say that, the, you know, the mere fact that there's not only do we know this instinctually, but now there's data, there's there's decades of data to prove that culture has an impact on business results. So for any for anyone or any, especially a senior leader who says, oh, culture, that's HR's responsibility, the the debunk to that myth is, well, are you responsible for the results of your team? Yeah. Well, then culture matters and you better pay attention to it and you better cultivate it and make it healthy. Because if it isn't healthy, it simply means that you're having your people swim up, swim upstream, you know, against, against the current. You're making it harder for them if you don't have a healthy, psychologically safe culture. So if you do indeed care about the results that you and your team achieve, culture matters. It's an input that gets you a better, long-term, more sustainable output. In, in your, yeah, in, in your <laughs> book and in a lot of conversations and in a lot of other interviews we, we've had on, on this show and, 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 and I've been interviewed for it as well. I, I love the perspective. And, and until I, I read your book, I didn't think about it this way, is that we talk about psychological safety. And it, and I just a couple of weeks ago, I was interviewed for an article and wrote about it and it was about Gen Z. And and it, it came out to be that, you know, having this completely safe space where you can say anything and no one's offended. And then it it, it sort of transforms into coddling. And we've heard that from every generation. We heard it. We heard about coddling Gen X, you know, as yeah. a baby boomer. We've coddled Gen X. We've coddled millennials. Now we're coddling Gen Z. That's not what safety psychological safety. And, and, I'll, and I'll just put this in this perspective. Over the last, last few years, I've been really entrenched myself in learning about and, and helping people adapt, just as you're creating that psychological safe space and helping people do it that way. I'm doing it from a change management standpoint. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the words that we threw out, what are the skills that you need to do that? One of them overlaps with what we're talking about today is grit. But grit isn't just, we, we tend to want to define it to one word. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. perseverance, it's fortitude. But grit is really for perseverance and passion. Resilience is bouncing back, but it's bouncing back in a timely manner. Yep. Psychological safety, you had, you know, you have your, your window, your Jahari window, and, and it's not just about creating that safe space where everybody feels good because that's not enough for people to speak up. Yeah. 
Well, I, I call it a photopia, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it isn't even a utopia. It's a photopia. So, I mean, psychological safety is not about bubble wrapping everyone so that no one can ever get harmed. I mean, that's just not human. You know, it's, it's part of our human existence that things go well and are great and things don't go well. And in fact, part of a psychologically safe environment and a speak up culture, and there's a distinction which I'll make between those because psychological safety is a big part of a speak up culture, but it's not the only part. Part of it is, is actually having environments where people can feel offended and that's okay. It's actually a sign of a strength of a psychologically safe culture for me to be able to say to you, Ira, I was actually offended by what you just said. I'm making this up. I'm not actually offended. <laughs> but for us to have that difficult, hard, kind, compassionate, curious conversation, which, by the way, is the type of discourse and conversation we need to make the progress and to make as a society and as a human race, by the way, is people get offended. Why? Because we're human and we're different even though we all have one thing in common, we all have a heartbeat, right? And so it's actually a sign of a strength in a psychologically safe environment and a speak up culture to be like, ooh, that offended me. Can we dig into that? Because I think most people don't walk around their day to day being like, who can I offend today? Most people. There are some, but most people. You know, and I think when someone is offended, that's actually an opportunity to dig in, grow together, learn more, and see if we can find some commonality and move to the move through it into into the other side of it. So th those are just a few comments there, and then I can share more about how psychological psychological safety is part of a speak up culture, a key part of a speak up culture. Yeah, and and part of that is also, I, I guess, you know, in the past, it's like, well, we have a safe space. We we have a whistleblower program. <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah. or, or we have a suggestion box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People anonymously speak up all the time. It's like, okay, if given the choice between no one speaking up at all and there being an anonymous function, I'd rather the anonymous function. But also with strength of a speak up culture is can we have hard confrontations and put our name next to our feedback? I do think there needs to be a place where anonymous feedback can happen. But I, I don't think we should, that should be the only one. And I don't think it's enough to say, I mean, A, the definition of whistleblowing means that you actually go outside of the organization, which means it's gotten really bad if that's happening. And we saw this with, with Boeing, with Ed Pearson and Kimberly Young McClear at the, at the United States Coast Guard as well. So yeah, if people are able to put their name next to the feedback or have those conversations live, now we're talking. That's a speak up culture. Yeah, and that's so important to, to the willingness to be able to put your name next to that feedback. Which, uh, which, by the way, if you don't feel that it's safe and worth it too, we're not saying put your name next next to feedback. If it feels like it is more productive for you to have it be anonymous, I'd rather you do that than putting yourself at personal risk or harm. Though speaking up isn't without fear it is with fear it's it's a risk modulator fear but yeah i'd rather you have it anonymous and still speak up if you feel that that's the best path for you yeah and i don't want to overlook this because i, I the, the piece that resonated with me was that it's not just feeling the ability to say what you 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 need to say or you feel you must say yes but it's that it's worth it yes Be because I, you know, sometimes, and, and I guess there's a crossover with that because, you know, there are situations or as organizations I'm in that I know I could say it, but is it worth it? Yeah. So there's, there's two things you're making me think of. I mean, one is the very thesis of the book. The other is something that's actually attributed to Craig Ferguson, who's the comedian, <laughs> British, British comedian. And he has, I don't know if he drew it as a Venn diagram, but it's, you know, management theorists have made it into a Venn diagram of does it need to be said? Does it need to be said now? And does it need to be said by me? And it's a really nice, I mean, speaking up isn't sucking up. Speaking up isn't just speaking your mind all the time with everyone, wherever you are. No, that can lack situational awareness and emotional intelligence. Um, I really do like that sort of Venn diagram of does this need to be said? Yes. Does it need to be said now? Yes or no. Does it need to be said by me? Right now? It's really interesting where it does need to be said. It does need to be said now, but not by me. That's a really interesting one where it's like, hey, Ira, can you show slide seven again and speak about the that note you made? Right. 
that's a really interesting one. But if you have a speak up culture, you can have that 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 conversation. And then the other thing you pointed on is, you know, I fully admit uh, the last time we had this conversation, uh, July 31st, 2022, I thought I was simply rebranding psychological safety in writing this, this book. I fully thought that, you know, I'm a big fan of psychological safety. I'm a huge fan of Amy Edmondson and her work, though she's not credited with founding the term. She put, certainly put it on the map with her famous hospital study, studying emergency rooms with and without psychological safety and the impact on medical errors and the reporting of medical errors. And Project Aristotle with Google, you know, there have been key moments where psychological safety has been put on the map. I never loved the term though. I never loved the term because I feel like we put an academic white lab coat on a very human emotion. And up until recently, my friends, I believe our friends, Minette Norman and Caroline Helbig wrote the book, The Psychological Safety Playbook which is an action oriented, like you believe in it, here's how you do it, which is wonderful. And so when I started writing Speak Up Culture, I thought that I was doing a good old Zig Ziglar, people don't buy drills, they buy holes. And so I thought if the drill is psychological safety, the hole, what you get is a Speak Up Culture. And I wanna market the result because we want that result. But as I dug into the research and the writing and how I understood the phenomena and then the research that supported it, it's not just psychological safety. It's also a perception of impact. It's what you pointed out. Does it feel safe to speak up? And does it feel worth it? Because some, if it's both safe and worth it, you have, you're likely to have a speak up culture. Both of those are perceptions. So both you and I could report into the same leader. I could call them the best leader ever. And you're like, do we report to the same person? They're awful. And we're both right, right? So it's all a perception. But if you look at, you know, I, I formed a two by two matrix with it. So top right, it's safe, it's worth it. Bottom left, it isn't safe, it isn't worth it. That's an unhappy marriage between fear and apathy. I've been there, no fun. I've seen others there. That's where you get quiet quitting and resignation and no surprise there. But the other two quadrants are really interesting. High safety, but low impact. Low safety, but high impact. So high safety, but low impact is you might speak up because you feel safe to do so, but you're left feeling not so confident that it's gonna lead to any meaningful change, whether it's due to bureaucracy and red tape, systemic issues that are too hard to overcome, uh, which is a good conversation in, in DEI, or a change in habit of leaders. You talk about adaptability and readiness to, to change. A big one is, are you willing to actually look at your habits and change them? And so I might be able to say to my best friend, hey, I don't think you should have three alcoholic beverages every night. I don't think it's good for your health. In fact, I know it isn't good for your health. Here's a study on it that says you should have no more than three a week, right? That's the current science on it. But am I left feeling that my best friend's going to change their behavior? No. And my willingness to speak up will diminish because apathy is going to set in, even if I feel safe. Now, the really interesting one for me, is, and this is where courage comes in, is there's low safety, but high impact. And you often get whistleblowing here, where I don't feel safe to speak up, but I'm so connected to the stakes, it feels too important for me to remain silent. This is what Ed Pearson did at Boeing when he saw that the 737 MAX was an unsafe plane, in his humble opinion, turns out he was right, unfortunately. And 346 people died after two planes went down, and he still believes it isn't a safe plane, and I tend to believe him. In fact, I avoid flying that plane now. The last time I flew it, I prayed before it went up and, and hoped that those first two minutes went smoothly, right? It's not a safe plane. It's not a well-built plane. And so to his own risk, to his reputation, his job, his relationships, he spoke up to all the right people who all ignored him. He eventually retires, and then he whistleblows to US Congress, and he's still advocating for the safety of that plane and for the victims and their families to be treated well and with respect. It seems, uh, it, you, it also in your book, you, you talked about, and I'm drawing a blank on the organization, it was right before the pandemic, well, not the organization, but the group of 500 leaders who came together and- Tell the story, maybe I'll remember it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying to remember, there was a, a group There's, of leaders that came together, Jamie, you know, Jamie Diamond, Oh, the uh, the the business roundtable. Yeah, the business roundtable, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. right, 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 yeah. right. And, and again, that and the reason that I'm bringing that up because we're we're going to take a short break. But when we come back, I want to talk about where we are now because I, I thought it was ironic, and I didn't 
I didn't pick that up until that moment because we sort of all blew off now what the what this roundtable came up with. Not blew off what they came up with, but the intention was right. But they yeah. they weren't necessarily walking the talk because a couple of the people you cited were the same people that said everybody has to come back to work. <laughs> when when we when we uh, the return to office was no. If you want a job, you're coming back to work. So I'd love to get your opinion. I think I know where it's going to go, but I'd love to get your opinion. Psychologically safe space in in the realm of where we're headed with hybrid remote work. And also, because it is different, building that remote hybrid culture, which we are building, regardless if you like it or not, we are building it. There's a hybrid remote culture. You know, what are some of the challenges that you see, you know, there? So great. We've got a lot to talk about when you come back, but we're talking with Stephen Shed Chetleski, new book. Uh, Let me put that up here. Title Speak Up Culture When Leaders Truly Listen, People Step Up, and to create a visual. If I can quickly find it here, I had a copy of your book image here, somewhere. I, I, can, I, can I got it right here. There we are. Yeah, there it it's is. right Beautiful. there, too. Very good. We will, you're listening to Geek Skeezers and Googleization. We will be right back. Are you ready to turn your organization into a vibrant, interconnected ecosystem where employees don't just work, but thrive? It's time to reimagine your workplace with every individual contributing uniquely to your collective success. Learn how to empower each team member to discover their own path while aligning with your organization's purpose. Create an environment where job satisfaction, employee engagement, and meaningful work intersect, creating a powerhouse of productivity, innovation, and fulfillment. Let us help you create the connected organization where you build bridges, not walls, between employees and their teams, roles, and your culture. So are you ready to bridge the gap? Let's embark on this journey together. Don't let your employees simply do their jobs and take home a paycheck. Let them connect, collaborate, and create a difference. Step into the future with a connected organization. Because when you're connected, you're unstoppable. Are your employees feeling stuck and just showing up for a paycheck? Is your workforce working harder to get back to normal than adapting to the future? It's time to help them break their addiction to certainty and develop a growth mindset. Developed by one of the world's top-rated future of work thought leaders, AQ Plus Mindset is a powerful tool to help your employees embrace change, adapt faster, and grow on the job. Conveniently delivered to any smartphone or laptop and easy to digest 5 to 10 minute lessons. Managers can sit back and watch employee attitude shift towards growth and innovation in just 30 days. Are you ready to help your employees thrive in this ever-changing, never-normal world? Encourage them to show more grit, resilience, adaptability, and unlock their potential? The journey to a growth-filled future starts with a growth mindset. Visit aqplusmindset.com or call 484-373-4300. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to Geek Skeezers Googleization. We're here with Steve or Stephen Shed Shedleski. It's a mouthful, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you can just call me Shed. I did it for a good reason. All right. <laughs> to Shed. So we're having a great conversation about speak up culture, psychological safety, and when we left off uh, right before the break, we were talking about where we are right now with hybrid work, remote work and uh, return to office. And there is a place to return to the office. Uh, We're not saying you never, never have to do that. And ironically, there are people that want to return to work if there's a reason to turn to work. There's very few people that say, no, I don't never want to be around another human being in my life. I don't like my coworkers. If they don't want to be around their coworkers, they don't like meeting with them occasionally, then there is no reason that they that, that's a bigger problem. <laughs> that's not what we're talking about today. That's not about speak up culture and it's, it's not about recruitment or retention. That you got a big problem, <laughs> but it's just not happening. And even people who, if you're forcing people back to work, obviously that's probably a symptom that you don't have a speak up culture <laughs> because sure. there may be people that aren't willing to share that. And then, but vice versa, vice versa there's people that are back in the office. And they may be unwilling to share what flexible looks like because remote and hybrid is not 
necessarily flexible. Four-day work week is not necessarily flexible work. People are looking for flexibility. So mm-hmm. to kind of unleash your wisdom yes. here. What, what's going on? <laughs> what are you seeing? And, and also differentiate between, because when you started to think about writing this, we were still in this, re- 98% of the people got up in the morning and they went to work, they commuted, they yeah. did their thing, they, they worked certain set hours, and now it's completely different. Yeah. So, I mean, first and foremost, there are, A, I mean, jobs out there that require you to show up physically, you know, could be, you know, in a healthcare setting. It could be on a, in a factory floor setting, right? My, my perspective on this is the nature of the work should dictate where it occurs. And if you're in management, but you lead people who must show up to work every single day, I would urge, by virtue of the nature of their work, I would urge you to show up probably every day as well or pretty close to it because your job is to support those people. But there are lots of people that I know who show up in an office just to, just to take Zoom meetings. That makes zero sense whatsoever. Yesterday, a friend of mine who works in a management role, he said, yeah, they're back in the office Tuesdays and Thursdays, but it is 100% dedicated to meetings that are best served to be in person, as well as socializing. Like they try to avoid any virtual meetings on Tuesdays and Thursdays, because those are the days that we come together. And it's really focused around what are those pivotal conversations that are best to happen in person, which there are a set of conversations that certainly are better equipped and more vibrant and, and intimate and dynamic in person, as well as socialization. You know, I'm a big fan of socialization. It, it matters. It's important, particularly if you're inspired by the purpose of the organization and there's a, there's a healthy culture. That's great. So, I mean, I think what human beings in general want when it comes to work is they want to be treated as the human beings that they are with respect, tact, dignity. They want to be paid fairly. They don't need to be paid the most, but fairly. And I do think that we want flexibility, which means that, you know, my business partner, it's his wife's birthday today. Do you know what I said to him today? you better not be working during the lunch hour because I hope that you take you and your kid out for lunch, right? And I wanted that to to happen. I didn't force him, but I said, take it easy today. Like, do what you got to do, you know? And I believe extending that flexibility extends trust, extends motivation, meaning that I I make up a story that he will work better, harder for us because we offer that dignity and that flexibility. So, you know... Like I, I look to a to an Elon Musk and Tesla, you're allowed to make whatever announcement you want. I hope that you justify it with reason. When Musk originally announced it, the last line of the email should have been the first line of the email. It actually explained the why of why he was making this decision around how he believed the company worked at its best, which is a manufacturing company. Fine. And if that's how you want to play it, like all good. Like be clear, be transparent, allow people to make a choice. But I do think having remote, hybrid, and in-person options is the way to go, depending on the nature of the organization and the work. Are you, are you seeing a difference in, or, or thinking about, because there's no clear answer yet, I'm sure, mm-hmm. thinking about creating this speak-up culture in a more traditional workplace where, where people come to work versus the hybrid uh, the the hybrid remote flexible environment i mean there so i actually think it's better to have the, the conversation first from talking about remote and hybrid there actually we do have accessibility to some tools that can make it actually easier for us to cultivate a speak up culture there's a few things going on one i mean when we are completely remote and hybrid we can have town hall meetings that feel more like the six o'clock news broadcast because there's thousands and thousands of people and it's very impersonal and hard to to speak up simply because there's just too many people in many minds you know but there are wonderful things that we can do with the technology at our fingertips including poll function emoji use right like you can actually create your own internal company language with emojis i've seen teams have printed color cards for for an express check-in on how they're doing, which could be, you know, green, I've got capacity, things are great, bring it on. Red, I'm overwhelmed. Yellow, I'm whelmed, you know, 
pink, I need a bathroom break, like whatever it might be, you can actually create a way of communicating in a, in a quick way in, in, in different ways. You can do breakout rooms. Like there's tons of things that you actually can do. One of the things that we can miss in remote and hybrid setups is serendipity, you know? let's say we were having this conversation live and we ended and we were sitting in the same studio together and there was a pastry table that was sitting there and we finished this up and we both walk over to the pastry table and we both go to reach for the last remaining cranberry muffin, right? There's a ton of other options, but for some reason we both gravitate toward the cranberry muffin. I'm like, cranberry muffin, are you into those? And you're like, I love them. I'm like, me too. Like the, the antioxidants, the sweet and tart, like we have this wonderful bonding moment over cranberry muffins. And the value of that is that should we continue to work closer together and keep this, this relationship, we might come across a contentious issue in five years time. And I can break the ice by saying, gosh, I could really go for a cranberry muffin right now. And we're both laughing, right? That's the value of in-person and, and serendipity. Now it is still possible to do it, but we need to manufacture it, right? There's great tools that we can create especially for a large organization where you connect two random people, one who works in product and one who works in marketing, which is good for business, by the way. You're going to get innovation from that conversation. So there are things that, that we can do, but fundamentally, it's the same stuff. Make it safe, make it worth it, encourage people to speak up and reward them when they do, especially when they share bad news and hard things to hear, if you want to hear it again. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And and every time I hear that, and and I just completed a neuroscience course uh, through Wharton, which I know people have heard me talk about. And and you know, a lot of those things you know popped up is that we do miss that serendipity. But I'm of the belief, and I've been saying this for the last three years, ever since we went on the pandemic, or almost four years now, crazy uh, how time flies. It is that it wasn't the separation that created the problems. The, the it was our inability to use the technology and use these tools and use the methods and think differently about how to create serendipity when we not we don't have that opportunity to get that muffin. Yeah, um, you know. So I, I we're so on a learning curve, and you know, and we're trying to do it on the fly, and yep. you know, and in time the to- the tools will even be better, the bandwidths will be better, and you know, I know you know, whatever the metaverse or AR or VR, I mean, there's going to be more opportunities, but I think where we look back, you know, I, I've said this before, when we look back, if the pandemic happened in 2010, not 2020, and we look at where we were with bandwidth technology, the the tablet, the iPad just came out. Hmm. It was brand new. And depending on when the pandemic hit, it might've been before the pandemic, the, the iPad. We didn't have all these tools to pick up and go home and quarantine. Yep. And yep. then yet 10 years later, all these things were just at our fingertips, which allowed us to probably save millions of lives and to and, and also not have an economy that that didn't lose 30 million jobs, but would have lost 60 million jobs, or we would have lost that many more people. Yep. So I, I think we're at that point now where that serendipitous moment is only because we don't know how to do it comfortably or technology we haven't caught up with the technology that's available yeah but it's available the but a a good friend of mine who's very outspoken on this topic of work from anywhere guy by the name of dave karens and his my favorite quote of his that he says is the greatest office luxury is the choice of whether to go or not we want choice absolutely it's human we uh, you know human beings want autonomy and, and agency and the organizations that are set up to provide that for their people Ha- are more likely to have a speak up culture, to have a trusting workforce, and have an environment where people want to show up to work, whether it's remote, hybrid, or in person, or all three. So hopefully, we've got enough people hooked that, that <laughs> or, or at least we, we've created some ideas, especially in people who said that the psychological safety thing is BS and people don't need to be coddled. And, and you know, uh, hopefully, we've changed a, a handful of minds. If someone's interested and said, Yeah, I, I know we got to do this. I mean, the suggestion box isn't working. <laughs> and I know when I ask the question, you can say, you know, I have an open door policy. Yeah. You know, nobody ever comes in with anything that's really challenging or it depends on the mood. And what's, what are some first steps an organization, a lead, leaders can take yeah. to create so this environment? Vulnerability helps. So for a leader to go, 
Hey, I've come across this idea of creating a speak up culture where people feel that it is safe and worth it to speak up. You know, I'd like to think that we have one, but I always know that there's room to improve. In fact, I know some areas where we don't have one. And it's really important. Your voice, what you see, what you feel, what you know, especially those of you who are closest to product development, closest to to customers, or see anything that could be working better, we need to hear these these ideas. Now, it's not going to be perfect. We might get offended. It might get heated. But if we truly wish to have a healthy, flexible, innovative organization that's going to be around for decades, we need to embrace this. And so my commitment for you as a leader is I want to encourage you to speak up, especially with your ideas, your feedback, your concerns, your disagreements. If you disagree what I, with what I believe, I need to hear that. I really do. And if I respond in a way that is counter to what I'm attempting to cast right now, I also need you to call me on that, right? Now, the, the, the behavior after that point really matters. Is there a gap between what you say and what you do? Because if you do, it's just lip service. So you've got to live into that message. So first, you've got to value your people's voice. Then you have to encourage it to come and then reward it when it does. And one of the things that, that, that you can do is you can say, you know, sometimes qualitative feedback is hard. Like any feedback, crickets, right? But what if you used quantitative? You could say, hey, team, I'm trying to improve my presentation clarity on a scale of zero to 10. How clear is that presentation? And if you all say 10, I think you're lying. I want to hear the threes and the six and the sevens in your reasoning so I can get closer to that 10. So those are a few ideas. Yeah, what, what crossed, just crossed my mind, we, and, and again, it's my, my older business, but I'm still, from, I'm still associated with it, it, was about 360 feedback. Brilliant tool. Love the tool. 99% of the possibility, potential clients I had, I talked out of doing a <laughs> talked out of it. And, and you know, we, we beat, beat out the bush if there wasn't vulnerability, transparency, it, there wasn't trust, with, you know, trust was, you know, within there. Don't do it. Yeah. Because, because yeah. either people aren't going to be honest or it's going to blow up in their face. So yeah. when, I, when I think about every, you know, I guess this is one of the messages for, for managers out there. When you're thinking about surveys, whether even in, even in this, it's one more engagement survey or a poll or taking a pulse or you're, you're being more robust than you're doing a 360 is you, you need to think about the speak up culture first. Yeah. O or yeah. you're just spinning your wheels. Yep. You're just going through the motions. You checked another box. Yeah, totally. Well, it's the same as I've just started listening to great podcasts. Is it Peter Adia? I could be getting this wrong. He wrote the book Outlive. Yeah, Peter, uh, Peter Atia or Peter Adia, A-T-T-I-A. -A. And he's... He's a, a retired surgeon, and he's focused his work not on just lifespan, but health span. Now, there are all these things that we can do to, to be healthy, which are, you know, fitness and exercise, diet, sleep, right? Healthy relationships. But if you don't have emotional well-being, all the others don't matter. So I, I think, first and foremost, you know, a 360 powerful tool but only really valuable if you're already on the journey. Like if you do it to point out that you've got a, an SHIT show, good for you. Like maybe start <laughs> some things, you know, you can get a baseline to be like really unhealthy, but it can actually do more harm than, than good. Get on the journey and then do consistent measurements. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. I've always said, if you ever think that a 360, you're going to have somebody and they get all this honest, truthful, candid feedback, and they're going to say, Oh, I didn't know I was like that. <laughs> you know, you're smoking something funny. Um, yeah. You know. Yeah. There, though th the 360 is a powerful enough tool that I've done 360s. And I, I went, I didn't know that I was being perceived that way, either positively or negatively. Right. But uh, yeah. going back, yeah. if you have a growth mindset, if you're willing to take that as feedback, yes. not as and as yeah. fuel, as yeah. fuel. Yeah, yeah. Totally, yeah. For, totally. For sure. Um, I, yeah. I can't believe and, we're almost coming up toward the end here. We got a, a, a couple things I, I wanted to cover. And one is, uh, you know, I couldn't get past this. You know, you spent 10 years with, with Simon Sinek, huge fan. I mean, I read his, I have all his books in, in, in the past, but in the last year and a half or so, got involved with the Y Institute, Discover Your Why great tool 
incredibly powerful. And I love, I, I, again, I think you shared this in, in an interview, is that what what this golden circle does, and then what this what why Institute even took it one step further, is to help people articulate what their why is. And you know, I, I just that's what my chapter of my book, this book, the self empowerment book, is about. It's about the why, but it was about mm -hmm. my journey. I was like, you know, I, I've got three degrees, I've got a master's in leadership, I've studied this for years, I've taken I don't countless courses on business management, and you know, people say, well, what do you you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? Or why do you do what you do? And I never could articulate it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so how much, I guess, how much influence did, I guess, being able to articulate your why have on us being here today? Yeah, great question. So for, I mean, first and foremost, I mean, there are plenty of amazing, inspiring, capable, you know, phenomenal leaders and people who have led a purpose-oriented, meaningful, fulfilling life and never articulated their purpose. It is not a prerequisite to start. You know, you don't need to, to have a clear articulation of your why to live your why, but it's a tool and it can help. Absent of having a clear way to describe it, you can describe a meaningful story, right? One of the ways, a great way to find your why is to think about meaningful stories from the past of when you were at your best, most fulfilled, or when you were most challenged, you know, a peak experience or a valley experience. And so when someone says, you know, why do you do what you do? If you don't have a great answer in a perfectly articulated, you know, two sentence prose, you can say, well, lo let me tell you a recent story of why I love what I do or why I love a friend of mine. You can tell a meaningful story that could take two minutes and isn't as quick as a as a two second uh, or, a, 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 you know, two sentences, but it still has meaning. It's funny, Ira, I was literally getting ready for this conversation and I was thinking about my why and I went, how lucky am I that I get to live my why in the work that I do? So my why is to engage with people in meaningful ways so that we connect with depth and live in a more fulfilled world, which is what I feel we're doing. Like I'm, my job is having meaningful conversations with, with you, with people to hopefully move them along building deeper relationship with themselves, the people around them, the world around them, so they experience more fulfillment, which is using their strengths to contribute towards something bigger than themselves that they care about. You know, my why has give, given me clarity, it's given me courage, it's given me meaning, direction, it helps me make sense of the world, of what I should move toward and what I should run away from of which there are all things that we should move toward and all things that we should say, not for me, rock on, but not my thing. And that's okay. Yeah. Um, and, so sh short answer is yes. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and like you, and, um, and again, this is what took me 40 some years. So, uh, you know, one of our goals is to help people get there sooner if they feel they need to articulate it. But, you know, mine's to help other people, help people find a better way to challenge the status quo and be extraordinary. And uh, again, that's what we do with the show. That's what we do with adaptability and an AQ and my life. And people say, oh, what, what are you doing now? Is that different than is for those who know me? I started out as a dentist. And, and technically, that's what I did then. It was what I loved doing was helping people come overcome the fear. What I really disliked doing was the repetitiveness of doing the work to clean teeth and fill. That yeah. wasn't necessarily challenging, helping people, it, it helping people be better and be healthier, but it didn't necessarily challenge, you know, challenge the status quo. Although I was computerized in 1987, I, we had these cameras that people are still have now in 1991. And I was like, what's next? And mm -hmm. it, it just didn't become fulfilling, but that's a long story. We've got to, unfortunately, we've got to start wrapping up. So there's a couple of pieces here. And one of the ways I like to wrap up this part of this, this segment of the conversation is to make sure we asked you or, or you covered what you wanted to cover. And so one of the questions is, what should I have asked you that I didn't? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think one of the big pieces of the book and the, and the conversation is around feedback and feedback conversations and what makes a good feedback conversation. You know, we've, we've pointed a lot to, this is a leadership conversation. So how do we fix leadership? I think is a good, good conversation for us to have. And I have some thoughts. But yeah, no, this was a treat to join you again. And happy to come back because I think we are always just scratching the surface amongst you and I and, and Jason. Yeah, uh, always. So next question. 
what's your, it's called hopes and fears. Mm -hmm. What's your hope? You know, what's your hope for the future and what's your fear for the future? My hope for the future, my fear for the future. So my hope for the future, I was just asked this question yesterday of, you know, there's so much wrong going on. There's so many things working against us. There's always bad news, you know, there's always poor leaders and positions they shouldn't be in. Like, do you even believe in this speak up culture thing? And should you bother? <laughs> it was kind of the question. And I, and I, I said, I'm not ready to give up. Like I still have hope. I believe I have hope in the positive generative nature that I see and believe in humanity as a whole. I think because we live in a time where it's so easy to access news, whether it's real or not, it's really easy to see all the bad that's going on, but there's also a lot of good going on and we have made progress. And so I'm hopeful for humanity. I'm hopeful for our ability to adapt, to evolve and to, you know, make the most of what we have. I'm fearful for the future and I'm fearful for the future that my children will inherit from a climate perspective. You know, I have written this book, Speak Up Culture, because I want when, when my kids and, you know, in 10, 15 years get their first job, I want them to work with a leader and not for a driver. And so my fear is, is the condition of the world that they will inherit and the quality of the leaders that they will work with and for. Uh, and I hope it's with, not for. Absolutely. Appreciate that. Now for the final segment, learn a little bit of, about you. Let's start with a, an easy one. Hopefully this is a layup. What's, what's your favorite type of music what, and, and or who's your go-to musical group? I really like funk, but not, <laughs> not, like, not your like quintessential funk, but like Prince or Paul Simon. There's a great YouTube channel called Scary Pocket. So I'm, I'm into toe-tapping, poppy funk stuff. Uh, well, I, I, I'm not exactly, but, um, you know, I, I always go back to, you know, but Santana, Earth, Wind and Fire. I mean, big groups, big bands, lots of yeah. lots of sounds, you know, going on. And uh, yeah, so very, nice. very similar. Upbeat. Nice. If there was one person in history, alive or dead, hmm. personal or professional, you could meet, who, would, who might it be? I'd love to have another lunch with my grandfather. Who's my mm. who's my late grandfather? He's a Holocaust right. survivor. My next book will be about him and his life story. I just want to spend more more time with him and ooze as much joy and meaning. So no Gandhi, no Martin Luther King, <laughs> just just my 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 Zadie Ben. Yeah, absolutely. And finally, last week somebody walked away with a billion and a half dollars in a lottery. If, if you <laughs> if, if you were the billion dollar lottery winner, what's the what would you do? Interesting. If I was the billion dollar lottery winner, I would try to find a way to invest in helping people build healthy relationships with themselves and the people around them. That's what I would try to do. I, I would I would use it. <laughs> I would use it to bring my why to life. I would use it to to help those who wish to be helped to have healthy relationships with themselves and the people around them. You know, I could go to climate crisis and this and that, but again, without emotional well-being, I don't think we can even fix some of the larger issues that we have. I think we need to work, you know, as George Carlin famously said in one of his stand-up skits, you know, the earth is fine. The people are effed. The earth is fine. <laughs> you know, the earth will be around until the earth is around until it gets sucked into a black hole. It's will we be around as renters because we aren't owners. Yeah, exactly. Wonderful. It's been a pleasure. And again, always goes too fast. Uh, let me put up a picture of your book here. Uh, what's other than uh, they can go to Speak Up Culture to pre order the book? It'll be out uh, October 3rd, I yep, believe. That's right. October Is that right? 3rd. Yeah. What other ways can people get a hold of you? Yeah, I'm very active on LinkedIn. So please feel free to connect on LinkedIn and write a message as well. So yeah, most active on LinkedIn and check out speakupculture.com. We have a newsletter there as well as a newsletter on LinkedIn as well. So LinkedIn and, and website. Wonderful. Chad, it's been a pleasure. Congratulations on the book. Uh, it is a great, great read. I'm sure I'll be going back and quoting on it. So you'll see a lot of it out there. Uh, and this was a, a wonderful conversation and uh, we'll be pulling a bunch of clips and uh, look forward to our, our next conversation. 
Thank you, Ira. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me back. I look forward to seeing you and Jason next time again. Yeah, appreciate it. Well, everyone, uh, again, thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. Thank you again, uh, uh, Shed, Shed Lesky. D- definitely go up to speakupculture.com and order his book. Also, you can order my book at uh, The Change, Insights into Self-Empowerment, which will be available as early as next week at iberwolf.com. And if you haven't had a chance yet to sign up for my newsletter, and we're focused on, at least for the next few weeks, on manager myths being being debunked by neuroscience, go to iberwolf.beehive.com. That's free as well. Shed's book is not free, but my newsletter and uh, my digital version of my book are free. Jason should be back with us in two weeks when we do our next live show. And uh, what else am I forgetting here? Oh, one a couple things. I, I don't want to miss this because we, uh, with Jason, we each week we talk about some takeaways. And, and there were just a couple things I jotted down. And this came out in the conversation that a, a speak up culture or psychological safety is not necessarily a suck up culture. I think, I think that's important to remember. Also, I brought this up uh, and we hear this also often when you talk about psychological safety and it's like, well, we have an open door policy. Well, open door policy is not necessarily, does not always equate and does, unfortunately, in my 40 years of, of business life, does not often equate to what Shed's talking about with a speak up culture and psychological safety. So those are uh, just a couple things that uh, resonated and I think they were important distinctions. And uh, hopefully if you have other ideas or, or other takeaways from this, please leave them in the comments, either on the live show or on the replays. And speaking of that, we again, Geek Skeezers and Googleization, we're now a top rated podcast. We're in the top one and a half percent. In fact, the last uh, few weeks, we've been in the top 100 of business and management podcasts in the U.S. So thank you all for helping us get there. I'm Ira Wolf. And special thanks again to Shed. Thank, special thanks again to all our listeners and audience. Thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. And until next time, don't let the shift hit your plans. Thanks for listening to Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization. This show was produced and edited by Hilton Productions.